and all the HP engineers were stunned. And I handed the calculator to them, and I told engineer after engineer after engineer, type the equation in from left to right, see how it works. And not one of them could do it. Not one of those other engineers could break from their preconceived skills of organizing how they would solve a problem. What's one of the best things technology does for us, especially computers? It saves us from our own mental work. The HP engineers should have realized that. So not one of them could realize that what I had realized, that you really should have a calculator type the same way you write it on paper. Why have two separate languages? Anyway, corporate culture was too, is too strong a force that keeps us from finding new and better ways sometimes. So Hewlett Packard turned me down with the what was to become the Apple One computer. They turned me down for the first of five times. Five times I got turned down by Hewlett Packard. Well, now Steve and I were going to build these little boards and sell them for $40. I had to sell my most valuable possession in the world, my Hewlett Packard 65 calculator. I sold it. Steve Jobs sold a van he didn't need at his home with his parents. And um, we got the money to design this PC board. We, and I got a phone call at work one day. And Steve said right away, are you sitting down? So I knew something was up. He said, I got a $50,000 order. What? I mean, we only invested a few hundred dollars. He's talking $50,000. My engineer salary was $24,000 at the time. So this was scary. I went to Hewlett Packard's legal department and I made sure every single division of Hewlett Packard turned me down before I went ahead and did this with Steve Jobs. So we, we're selling completely built computers. How do you build computers if you have no money at all? Zero. Well, we got the parts on 30 days credit. We had 30 days to pay them back. We built the computers in 10 days and then drove them down to a store where we got paid cash on delivery. So really, the store took the credit. And we had a third partner in Apple at that time. Steve had 45%, I had 45%, and a friend, Ron Wayne, had 10%. And he did things like worked on our manual and sketches and legal documents and stuff. Well, after a while, Ron Wayne got scared that at some point in time, we weren't going to get paid. We were going to get the parts, owe the money on them 30 days later, not get paid. And Steve Jobs had no money, and I had no money, so Ron Wayne was sure they were going to come get the money from him. So he sold out his 10% of Apple computer for a few hundred dollars. True story. <laughs> so, um, anyway, now, now we're, you know, shortly after, this was our garage period. We didn't design any computers in the garage. We didn't have a telephone in the garage to call stores to sell our computer, to call part suppliers to supply us, to call magazines for publicity. That was all done in Steve's bedroom. But you know, you kind of have to work at home. And so the garage is very commonplace. We put up a lab bench, and it was our meeting place. It was where we tested the computers that were built somewhere else. And it was the place that we met guests and showed them what we had. Well, very shortly, after we had this Apple One computer, as a matter of fact, the very first time we ever showed it at any sort of conference, and it was a conference of 40 little companies, and every company was two young people just out of college, like Steve and myself, trying to make something out of these little microprocessors. So it wasn't really a conference in any professional sense, but we took the Apple One there. Even by then, I had come up, I had designed the Apple II. It's like every magic of engineering I had ever done in my life all came into this one, one piece of equipment. I would take two sets of memory and combine them to make one. I would take a circuit that had eight chips and figure out how to do it in five, and I'd think and think for a week and figure out a way to make it in one chip. And just amazing, amazing steps. So it came out to half as many chips as the Apple One, ten times the computer. It was twice the speed, it had color. Nobody ever could have imagined color coming to computers. When I tested my idea and showed it to Steve Jobs, we were both shaking, we were shaking and we were chilled because we knew that this was a revolution, it was a eureka moment. It was like this was gonna be a big time deal for us. We didn't give this one out for free. Um, the, the computer had graphics. 
just by putting numbers into memory in a certain place, a blue square would show up on your TV. A different number might bring up a red square or a yellow. And you could see how you could program numbers to move around in memory and make the screen move like video games. This was going to be a great game machine, so I built in paddles and sound. Nobody ever thought a computer and a game machine should be one and the same until now. We even had high-res graphics where you could see individual pixels and see things like pictures and photographs. So it was a very, very incredible computer. We knew, based upon how this market was developing, that we could sell a thousand computers a month. But how do you build a thousand computers? You need big money. And we had zero money still. We went to some corporations and tried to interest them in buying our computer. And I was very embarrassed because I had just designed this thing part-time. Two computers over a year. I had designed cassette tape for mass storage. I had designed a bunch of other things and I'd written the basic language. Well, we went in and talked to a company and they said, what do you want? And Steve Jobs shocked me. He said, well, we want a few hundred thousand dollars and we want to be in charge of the program in your company and we want stock. And I was shy. I'd never been around business. And I thought, oh my God, how can you ask for so much for just that much of my engineering time? And uh, they turned us down and other companies turned us down. We talked to venture capital people and we had no business experience, Steve Jobs or myself, and they didn't like, our answers weren't as complete and sophisticated and professional. But we finally ran into this angel, Mike Markula. Mike Markula had worked as an engineer and then worked in marketing. He felt marketing was the essence of companies, was more important than the engineering. And he worked at Intel. He was well respected, very high up in Intel, and he retired with a stock option. So he had his million dollars and he was living in the Cupertino Hills, investing money for his family, investing friends for friends too. And he was looking for something to do in electronics. He was still quite young. So we started talking to Mike, and he believed in what we had. He believed in the personal computer revolution. He believed that machines were coming, that people were going to use at home, and it was going to be one of those huge markets that grows to billions of dollars within a few years. And I was quiet. When he said we would have a company that would be a $500 million company in five years, uh, I was quiet, because how can you ever talk such huge numbers in the world? You know, but I guess the higher stature you are, the more right you have to talk those numbers. Internally, I didn't really think such numbers were possible. Mike Marco was willing to fund us a quarter of a million dollars, which is a lot more in today's dollars. And he, but he put up a condition. I had to leave Hewlett Packard. And I said, why leave Hewlett Packard? Just moonlighting, doing this work on the side. I've developed, in one year, I've had two computers and basic languages, and I've developed all these other ideas and, and um, devices. And he said, no, you have to leave Hewlett Packard. And he said, you have until Tuesday to decide. So on Tuesday, I went and met with Mike Markula and Steve Jobs. And I had gone deep inside my soul. And I had grown up with this strong sense of ethics that I would never be swayed by money and that I would be who I was in life and what I wanted to do. So I told him, no, I'm not going to take the money, I'm not going to start Apple. I want to be a Hewlett Packard respected engineer for life. And I want to design computers for the world. And I want to design software. But I can do that on my own time and I can give it away. And Steve Jobs went into a frenzy. And he got my relatives and my family and my friends to start calling me and saying, take the money, take the money. And finally, one friend that I respected very highly, the only other technical friend I'd ever known back in school even, um, convinced me that you could start a company and you didn't have to run it. You could be an engineer for your whole life and start the company to make a lot of money, to get rich. And that was the point. I needed somebody to say it was okay to start a company, but be an engineer. Because I was the sort of person that, from my shyness, I could never really say bad things to other people. I'm too nice of a person. I could never, like, fire somebody or tell them they're, what they're doing is junky. I didn't want to run the company. I just wanted to do my engineering. And that day I left Hewlett Packard and we started Apple for real and took the money. Um, over time, a lot of great, it was really great to see things like game technology on computers.